G'day guys. Um, it's been a beautiful day in Hobart, relatively. It is going to rain, la they did say, later on today. Now, will it, whether it will or not, I'm still waiting for the rain to, to appear. But uh, we did have about 25 in Hobart, so it was nice. Nice and sunny out there. So I did go out for a bit of a walk earlier today. And uh, then later on, I went up the sh shop. But anyway, that's not the reason I'm actually contacting you. While I was in the shop, I actually thought about, I'm going, mm, people, you know, require certain foods. You know, we know that the world is changing. Um, energy and food are going to be much more important in the going down the in the future uh, for the simple reason that we've destroyed the supply chains. It's going to take a decade before a lot of this sort of stuff gets sorted out. We don't know whether it's going to get sorted out properly or not. Um, there's a lot of risks at, at the moment for regional wars, mass migration, um, malnutrition around the world, um, you know, blackouts and all sorts of problems uh, because of the current state of affairs with food supply, energy supply and everything else under the sun. So even at the high tech area, you've got chip supply, not enough chips. Um, so there's, and we're not talking about the potato chips, we're talking about the, you know, silicon based ones. Yeah, so really the things are looking dicey in that regard. And so I thought about it um, coming back. This was in the morning. This is, I'm in the, uh, in the afternoon now. And I'm going, hmm, maybe I should make a video. So I did leave a, a comment on one of Wes's um, earlier. And I said, yeah, well, maybe I need to um, bring this to other people's attention about commodities and stuff like that. So this will be on the kings of commodity. And, uh, you know, what sort of things may be accessible in your neck of the wood or not. So let's, let me share my screen. My screen, my screen. Come on, do it. Okay. Yeah, I've been having a few little niggly things with my connection. But anyway, we'll proceed. Hopefully it won't fall over. I'll have to re-record it otherwise. Um, this is the UN stuff, uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO, and they hold statistics from all countries. So all nations basically submit their statistics to the UN. This is just the raw data. They aggregate it and actually then create these graphs of that raw data that the different countries have provided them. Now, we can only go on the accuracy of the countries that have provided the data. And, uh, you know, nothing's been adjusted. It's just pretty much um, an aggregate number, in a sense, from my understanding of the data. So you've got producers, production, imports, and exports. Of all, I've selected, you can actually, you know, if you want to, you can actually select your country by commodity. So countries by commodities, which means that it looks at the, what are countries produce. So when we're looking at wheat, you know, mainland China, India, is. Um, follow um, follows after mainland China, Russian Federation, then the United States, then Canada, and onwards. So those are the main producers of wheat in the world. Um, then, but you know, they may be, let's say, the amount they're producing, they may be consuming the whole lot. So that means there's not going to be much left for exports, so to speak. So that doesn't make them a commodity king. A commodity king is one who can export stuff out. That means they can satisfy their own population and they can export the rest out. So, you know, but it's interesting to know what your country can produce as well. So you can go by commodities by country. So you can actually pick, um, in this case, I will pick 
Oops. Australia, since I'm an Aussie. And I can look and see, you know, top 10 commodity production in Australia. So sugar cane. What did that doesn't that surprise me that we we produce a lot of sugar cane because we know the soft drinks and many other things. <laughs> Wheat is the second biggest um, uh, thing that we produce. Then barley. Then raw milk of cattle. Um, then meat of cattle. Then rape seed, which is we know what what that is. Um, <laughs> seed oil. Uh, grapes, meat of chicken, oats, potatoes. So those are the sort of things that um, we sort of produce. That means pr produced. This is in value. This is a bit of a different thing. So as you can see, cattle, meat of cattle returns much more money. So in comparison to the others, that's why, you know, simple, as we call refined carbohydrates, simple carbs are much cheaper where animal products are much more expensive in that regard, especially when you're not producing enough. And so supply and demand can play, a, have a factor in that as well. You know, where if you go back to the 1970s, meat um, was much cheaper compared to today because the level of production of large ruminants is the same. It's actually declined slightly. We actually got like over a, a billion and then we came back below a billion animals like beef. Um, and the US was over 100 million and has sort of come back below 100 million. They, they're 10% of the global production, um, the US. But the population has doubled since then. Obviously, we've gone more kibble, you know, not 70% odd plus. So that's the reason for that, why the other commodities have, have been growing since the 70s, where animal livestock hasn't, even though it actually returns pretty good value. You know, meat, um, raw milk, you know, milk, uh, wheat's in there, um, meat from sheep, meat from chicken, and then all the other stuff. So it's got a better return for the farmer, these sort of things, but for the producers that, are, that manufacture refined um, products and all that, it's all these other things that are much cheaper um, in general. So they don't return as good to a farmer, um, but they definitely, you know, for the manufacturers, they're definitely a better thing. So that's value. This is the actual production in in tons, and that's important. How much is being produced? You know, how much people are making money on. For the average consumer like us, we're less concerned about that, unless you're basically a commodities trader. You know, um, uh, you know. So this gives you the, the ability to look at look at these sort of things. What is your society? Um, sort of uh, produce and that can give you an idea and say okay my society produces these so if things the supply chain really gets even worse or we have regional wars or regional conflicts or things really get upended what can my society provide me and what do I need to the word hoard you know put aside you know um, things in us in cases for us people like you know that are more carnivorous you know will will basically be trying to put away certain animal foods and all that. And already we can see some prices, like, for instance, the raw um, cheese that I used to buy was about eight, nearly $9, slightly less than $9. Um, now it's something like nearly $13. It's dramatically jumped because of the fuel prices, the cost of transport from France to Australia, all these things have pushed up the, the cost of the actual product itself. So these are the, these are these are reasons. So anything that you import is going to be more expensive um, than what you produce domestically. So that's how you can basically gauge and say, okay, in a couple of you know, in a, you know, things are going to get worse. So what are the things that I we don't produce enough and are likely to go much higher in price? This is what this will sort of give you a bit of a, 
away by looking at the production. Now, you can also look at imports. Um, what is your country primarily importing um, in that regard? So that's another important thing to know. What are you dependent on? Oops. Too far. Australia. People will be able to... I'll put a link. So... Soybeans, cakes, which is processed soybean. Ah, that, that doesn't affect us carnivals. Food preparation, wheat, rice, rice milled, paddy, beer of barley, other non-alcoholics. So for the alcoholics, better stock up. Uh, pastry, you know, so a uh, mix of pig, pig bone. So it's things of that sort. So that's not going to really, you know, probably meat of pig bone is something that more of the Asian communities consume. So I suspect that's it's coming from Southeast Asia and other, um, and China and um, Southern, Southern Asia and parts of those sort of areas, this sort of pro these sort of products. So it's not really going to affect most people in Australia in that regard, unless you, um, some of these other products you know, like rice and all that, if you're a kibble eater or one of the bodybuilders that consume lean meats and rice, very inappropriate, but anyway, they do. So, you know, they'll have to cough up a bit more in that regard. So, key thing is, you can look at also commodities by country. So, what does Australia primarily export? Yeah. Okay. So wheat, we export. Yeah. So if you're a wheat eater and a barley eater, um, then um, you know that pretty much those products are going to be um, not going to be very expensive. Uh, raw cane and beets, um, rapeseed oil. So pretty much cattle, beef. We'll be, we'll be fine when it comes to beef, wine. These are the top, you know, you can actually download the whole lot and actually look at look at more data. So meat of sheep, tallow. So pretty much when it comes to beef and tallow and um, sheep, uh, we're fairly well covered in Australia. So... Again, that's yeah, these sort of things. If and you get a full sort of list going export quantities in, in Australia. So, in terms of tonnage, the amounts, the quantities. In that regard so this can give you an idea um, of what you know major commodity exporters who are they who are the major commodity exporters you know, Brazil when it comes to soybeans United States when it comes to soybeans Indonesia when it comes to palm oil the Netherlands crude organic material um, France, when it comes to wine, why does it surprise? Why doesn't that surprise me? <laughs> Malaysia, palm oil, <laughs> that doesn't surprise me either. Um, U.S. corn, maize, <laughs> obviously. Uh, United States uh, food preparations, you know, which is sort of processed food, is what we're really talking about. Um, India, rice, um, obvious. Russian Federation, wheat. Yes, we know. They're a major exporter of wheat. Argentina, cake and soybeans. Um, India, rice milled. Brazil, meat of cattle boneless, fresh and chilled. Yep, we know they're a big producer of, of uh, cattle. Uh, 
So Lukey will be fine. <laughs> so if the supply chain collapses, there'll be more in the internal market and it'll become cheaper. <laughs> so <laughs> should give ideas to the Brazilians. I'll start, um, uh, you know, boycotting <laughs> their export markets, <laughs> their ports, uh, Brazil, raw cane and beet sugar. Well, you can get rid of all that. <laughs> Italy, wine. Yes, yes, more winos that you can poke a stick at. Italy and the, and the French. Um, uh, United States, wheat. That doesn't surprise me as well. You know, Canada, wheat. Yeah, big producer. Um, so ethanol, alcohol, <laughs> spirits, <laughs> liqueurs, United Kingdom. They're on the hit. They're on the strong stuff. Those <laughs> And Australia, meat of cattle. Yep, obviously Argentina, maize, corn. So that gives you a bit of a there's, you know, I mean, you can exp you can download the entire, um, a whole lot of lists, and there are other bigger lists that you can actually find. You can go and get all the raw data for your country and download it um, under the data thing. So you can go there and grab that sort of stuff. This is just to bring to your attention this website so you're aware of where to look, what are the likely commodity kings of the future, um, so it's it's interesting to sort of look at those sort of things um, and just remember the, the the big ones when it comes to let me just go to That's the other one I didn't look at, the export. Export partners. Um, now, just let me share that. The last one down here is major export partners. So it looks at different countries, like, for instance, Albania. Um, exporters, exports from Albania mostly go to Greece, then Serbia, then the United States, then Germany, then Italy, as an example. So you can actually see who they're actually trading with primarily as well. So we'll go to, a, we'll just go to Australia, since I live in Australia. So Australia's top, um, you know, major export markets are mainland China, Japan, US, Republic of Korea, Indonesia, Vietnam, New Zealand, Singapore, um, China, Chinese Hong Kong, and Malaysia. That's the top 10. You can actually see it's primarily within the region, um, the nine out of 10, and one being the US um, outside the region. And that's because US and Australia have trade relations, military relations, and all that sort of stuff. And that's understandable why that happens. Um, but the others are obviously are going to be your regional partners. So Australia, because it is within the Asian type region, Oceania, still part of it borders on um, uh, on Eastern Asia primarily, and it will trade primarily with these sort of societies. So what happens to them affects Australian trade, and that's the other way you can actually look at who are your major partners. Um, what are the actual politics with, between those major partners and how that could have ramifications or effects on your society in that regard. So anyway, I'll leave you with that. And uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, that's the commodities um, data and... Uh, some of the kings of commodities and uh, some of the players and what is um, being exported between countries and all that. It's interesting because at least you know that um, where certain shortages could potentially happen in certain commodities um, based on the sort of regional relationships, like if things fell apart even further with China, that could actually be a benefit for the not for the exporters or for the domestic 
sort of agricultural sector, you know, that could be painful for the local farmers, but for the local population, it could actually mean cheaper prices for a lot of things. So it's never not necessarily, you know, it'll be for the economy, it won't be a good thing because it will mean the old balance of payments is negatively affected. Um, but at the same time, for the actual, the local people will become cheaper. I remember when the Chinese actually um, sort of put a whole lot of restrictions on, uh, lob on lobsters coming from Australia. And the lobsters, you know, that were, you know, in the $100 mark dropped down to 20 bucks. So I could actually go out and buy, you know, Pay a hundred bucks and buy five lobsters. Put put the other the others in the fridge and actually have lobster. You know, I had a ball of a time enjoying lobster for quite some time. So that can happen as well. So it's it's important to know what your society produces and what's likely if further disruptions in the supply chain, further disruptions um, occur within the energy supply. It will mean that these are the commodities that are most likely to be more more available in your society than others. So that's important because then you can say, okay, we don't produce this sort of stuff. I need to actually stock up on those items. But these other items, I don't have to worry, they're going to become cheaper potentially. You know, so there's a lot of those factors. It gives you ability to manage the future of your food supply as best as possible. I mean, I, I don't expect people to be commodities experts and this sort of stuff, but at least you'll have some idea of what's happening in your society within the agricultural sector and what your society is importing as well. So you can say, well, you know, you may be, let's say, I do have some subscribers in the Arab world and you may be um, in one of the Arab countries and one of the key supply partners, they may have issues um, either with your leadership of your society or just because of the supply chain, there is that possibility. Now, you need to know that information so you can actually say, okay, these are the things that likely may become limited down the track. I need to consider how do I get these things and how do I store them and stuff like that for a certain period of time. So there is, well, there's a lot of, you know, when it comes to animal foods, how do you preserve them? There's a lot of videos out there showing how to use salt and other things to actually preserve them, how to put them in, in jars where you can actually preserve meats for a very long period of time. There's a lot of approaches you can actually use. So do check those websites and you'll find information. I've been taking a bit of a look. Um, I'll throw one of those um, in into my co um, community page um, so people can actually go and get an idea of what what to look out for, but it's really that um, that's, um, and I'll probably put a link on one of them up here. It'll, it'll give you an idea of the stuff you need to look at and how to go about. It, this is all about, guys, about the, the future commodity kings and food security. That's what this video is about. And I'm trying to give you a bit of a, you know, data-driven, um, uh, you know, information um, video. So you can actually check and see and compare because just having, um, you know, we know that things are not looking good and they're going to get worse. But jumping up and down or running around like a like a chook with your head cut off, that's not going to fix the problem. You know, um, we can through social media, through other ways, through sending interesting letters to our polit politicians you know about you know why aren't you doing this or why aren't you doing that that's important as well um, to put pressure on them but at the same time you can't rely on others you know you can rely on your family your friends yourself you know and knowing what situation is in your part neck of the woods what are the potential threats, risks, and stuff like that. What do you need to plan for the future and mitigate? That's what this video and some of the other videos that I do are about. I'm trying to give you information and also show you, like I did with the other one, how unrealistic some of the nonsense out there is, you know, about let's decarbonize the economy, how ridiculous and unrealistic that is. That's the sort of, you know, people we have running the show at the moment. That's worrying, really worrying. 
You know, it's the sort of thing we had at the end of the of the Western Roman Empire. We had these sort of people. It's a worry. They don't know what they're doing. They're very dangerous. And you cannot rely on these people to save the day. You need to step up within your own communities. Um, you know, I encourage people to go to more rural communities. They're going to be safer in those sort of communities. There are, you know, strength in numbers in those and rebuilding rural communities is a good idea. And, you know, it's going to be much more problematic and precarious within um, major cities. That's just the reality. Um, yes, it does mean that potentially you have to make some lifestyle adjustments to your life long term. Um, but, uh, you know, flashy notes, which become worthless at some point, um, you know, is not going to save you. But it depends on your society and all that. Like in Australia, that's less of a risk because Australia is a massive exporter, produces more energy, more food, and more, like three times the food, many times over the energy, and many times over any other country or its own requirements, domestic requirements for minerals. So this country is in that risk in any way. And so if things regionally fell apart and you had to rely on yourself, you have the, the materials and a, a highly educated society in Australia to be able to cope. Other societies are more vulnerable than that, have less capacity and all that. And so this is for everyone to look at their society and consider. So for some people, um, the risk mitigation is going to be minor, like in Australia. For other people, it's going to be major you know, in different parts of the world. So there, there's going to be a lot of varied levels um, which they will have to navigate. But this is sort of just a bit of information, like I'll be doing a, more videos of this sort, covering some of this to actionable information, things so you know you've got knowledge of where your society is and what you can do. You've got some raw data and you can say, okay, this is what's available in my society, this is what I may need to cover. And these are important things, you know. It's like also looking at, um, you know, water supply and stuff like that. You know, how's that supplied? If it's desalination plants and we're dependent on bringing in energy from elsewhere, is that energy going to be available to provide those desalination plants the ability to produce the water or not? You know, these are the things. What if the society sort of unravels a bit? Will these things be available then? Look at Libya. Maybe not. You know, you know, that's the things that you have to look at and consider as a person. What are the likelihood of these things happening in my society? And what do I need? What sort of steps do I need to do to make myself less reliant on the system? So in some societies like Australia, it's less of a problem. In other societies like you know, I don't want to use any specific site, but let's say Tunisia as an example, things are far more precarious in terms of food supply, energy supply, you know, you know, things could really unravel very fast like they did last time. So that's the sort of stuff we want to look at. We want to look at our societies, what strengths and weaknesses it has, and also what steps we can take. And what it is within our capacity, you know, maybe simple things like, you know, okay, I get some chickens, put them in the backyard. I've got meat, I've got eggs. I'm not reliant on those things. You know, I butcher the, I butcher the, I'm a, you know, the male, you know, the, the male roosters and just leave one rooster to do all the work, as you know. So that's the sort of stuff, you know, we look, we have to look at and assess. And it depends, you know, which socioeconomic part of the society you are. It's going to have different effects and you've got to have different capacity compared to someone else. 
you know, someone else that's on a much lower wage than me may not have the capacity to pay their bills or stuff like that. So it's all these sort of things. So all I'm saying is, you know, you need to make some plans. Anyway, that's it. See yous.